The Zinari were relentless. Their ships swarmed our border colonies, wave after relentless wave of vicious insectal fighters spitting acid and plasma. They were the scourge of the civilized galaxy, a tide of aggression that seemed impossible to stop. When they turned their beady compound eyes on the fledgling Galactic Republic, I knew I'd have a war on my hands. I'm Fleet Admiral Cora Shan, former explorer, accidental politician, and now the woman tasked with keeping our ragtag alliance from shattering into stardust. We'd had our squabbles, humans, the avian descended Corians, the industrious mole like Tull, but facing imminent annihilation had a way of focusing priorities. Our combined fleets were formidable in their own right, but against the Zinari hive mind, they were a pebble skipping against a tidal wave. The early war was brutal. It's one thing to see battle simulations, the cold casualty figures scroll across your screen. It's something altogether different to hear the voices of your pilots, filled with fear and triumph, crackle across calms as they're vaporized before your very eyes. They weren't just numbers, they were faces, people I'd shared drinks with in the mess hall. Each lost ship wasn't a strategic setback, it was a wave of gut-wrenching grief. We learned quickly. The Zinari were single-minded, prioritizing offense over all else. Their ships were fast, lightly armored, and their tactics boiled down to overwhelming numbers. They were a battering ram, and at first, we were the flimsy wooden door. But humans are nothing if not adaptable. We couldn't match their speed or aggression, but we could match their unpredictability. My first order as Fleet Admiral had raised more than a few eyebrows. It seemed wasteful, almost cowardly. Every able-bodied civilian was ordered to evacuate border systems. It felt like giving up territory before the first shot was even fired, but I was playing a longer game. The Republic had resources the Zinari couldn't even fathom, industry, production capacity, and a desperate ingenuity. One of our greatest advantages was the Corian Farseekers. With their empathic abilities and unique connection to the ethereal currents of the universe, they could sense impending attacks well before any senses. Still, early warning only got you so far when faced with a foe flooding entire sectors at a time. We spent those first few months falling back, sacrificing ground and leaving empty worlds in our wake. We gutted mines, stockpiled weapons, and turned every ounce of scrap metal into the makings of a very unconventional fleet. The Zinari feasted on what we abandoned, blind to the trap we were laying. Then came the siege of Tull Prime, the industrious heart of the Tull hegemony. Their subterranean cities were a maze of tunnels and workshops, a natural fortress almost impervious to orbital bombardment. The Zinari knew this, so instead of a rain of fire, they went for the throat, a concentrated ground assault. They poured out of their dropships, wave after wave of chittering insectoids, each bigger and more heavily armored than the last. The tool held their own. Their digging equipment became devastating up close weapons, and every twist and turn of their tunnels was a choke point designed to bleed the enemy forces. But even the resilient tool couldn't hold forever. Our fleet wasn't far, seemingly hanging back, letting our allies take the brunt of the fight. I felt the cold knot in my stomach, knowing that every minute I delayed was another hundred lives lost on the ground. But it was the only way. Finally, a hoarse voice crackled over secured calms tool command, desperately requesting relief. My reply came back like a whip crack, negative. Execute protocol, Blackbriar. Seconds later, the network of abandoned orbital laser platforms we'd been jury-rigging for months flared to life. They weren't the pinnacle of weapons technology, hell, most were repurposed mining lasers, but they didn't need to be. We'd peppered Tall Prime's orbit with them, a hidden lattice of firepower surrounding the embattled planet. The beams weren't aimed at the swarm of Zinari ships, as one might expect. Instead, they targeted the planet itself. We surgically lanced the crust, not deep enough to cause true harm, but enough to trigger a seismic chain reaction. Tool Prime, with its intricate honeycomb structure, was the perfect amplifier. The result was biblical. The ground rippled and cracked, not in a planet-shattering way, but a calculated cascade of landslides and sinkholes. Right under the feet of the Zinari. Thousands of their warriors, their siege engines, and even some of their smaller ships were swallowed whole or pulverized by shifting earth. The Corian seers were screaming warnings over calms, their usual calm shattered by empathy for the Zinari troops and the terror of an enemy suddenly being consumed by the very world they invaded. The Zinari ground assault faltered, then broke entirely. Their single-mindedness, their greatest weapon, became their downfall. They weren't programmed for this, for the ground itself becoming fluid and hostile. We lured them into a natural disaster disguised as a battlefield. Even from my flagship high above, I couldn't help but grin at the sheer audacity of it. Then came the second phase that even I'd only reluctantly approved, our own fleet, finally moving in for the attack. 
It wasn't a fleet of sleek destroyers or nimble fighters. Instead, it was a hodgepodge of vessels hastily cobbled together, asteroid tugs, heavy mining ships, even freighters jury rigged with missile banks. They were ugly, slow, and would have been sitting ducks against anything resembling a conventional navy. But the Zinari weren't conventional anymore. They were disoriented, scattered, and their numbers drastically depleted. We didn't just press our advantage, we exploited their core weakness. Our fleet didn't engage in ship-to-ship -ship combat, but in calculated bombardment. They rained asteroids down on clusters of surviving Zinari, clogged vital attack routes with scuttled freighters, and even deployed vast chaff clouds laced with corrosive particulates, a tactic the Tull had picked up from their time fighting subterranean pests. It was warfare distilled down to its most brutal, a slugfest designed not just to hurt the enemy, but to break their spirit. The Zinari command ship, a bio-organic leviathan that dwarfed even our largest cruisers, was our primary target. It was an insult to my sense of aesthetics, all jagged angles and exposed, pulsing viscera, but it was undoubtedly the brain of the swarm. That's where we needed to strike. A decommissioned fuel transport ship, packed to the brim with volatile ore, got the honors. Guided by a skeleton crew who'd volunteered despite knowing the odds, the transport rammed the Zinari ship in a blinding explosion that rippled through space itself. The Zinari command structure never recovered. Their attack formations dissolved in disarray, the unified horde mind seemingly screeching in confusion. The siege of Tool Prime wasn't a clean victory, far from it. We'd lost a huge number of troops on the ground, and countless Tull civilians had suffered alongside them. My fleet was more a debris field than a fighting force by the end. But we'd held, and more importantly, we'd struck back. The Zinari, those who survived at least, fled back beyond our borders, their relentless onslaught blunted. For a moment, the galaxy could breathe a collective sigh of relief. But it was only a moment. The next wave would be larger, smarter. They wouldn't make the same mistake twice and underestimate us. Word of the Blackbriar Protocol and our salvaged armada spread throughout Republic space. Some called it brilliant, others barbaric. There were even whispers of mutiny, officers questioning the order to sacrifice a world, even as a temporary measure. I ignored them. In war, there are no easy choices, only necessary ones. The Zinari had learned a hard lesson, witnessed tactics outside their programmed aggression. But so had I. We were playing their game by their rules, and we were always going to lose that way. If we wanted to survive the next attack, the next planet, and the one after that, we needed to be bolder, more cunning, even more ruthless than the insectoid horde that pounded on our door. We needed to become a nightmare the Zinari could never even imagine. Victory on Tull Prime came at a steep cost and a short-lived celebration. News of our tactics spread like wildfire, and the whispers of mutiny grew louder. The Tull were furious, their grief mixing with an undercurrent of distrust that prickled along my spine whenever I walked among them. Even the Corians, usually bastions of tranquility, gave me sidelong glances tinged with apprehension. I'd won them a battle but lost a piece of their trust, and I wasn't sure I could ever get it back. I took the brunt of the protests head on. Every tear-filled accusation about barbarism, every hissed question about the value of one world versus another. I answered. Calmly, bluntly, with an unwavering voice that hid the tremor in my own heart. We couldn't wait for the Zinari to come to us, we had to take the fight to the enemy even if the battleground was unorthodox. I showed them not just casualty statistics but the faces behind those numbers, families whose homes the Zinari would have chewed through had we not forced them back. Still, it wasn't enough for some. Admiral Veer of the Corian fleet, with feathers ruffled in agitation, voiced a sentiment that echoed across the fractured alliance. This is what we signed up for, Fleet Admiral. The Republic was meant to be a shield, not a plague. The words stung, because, deep down, he wasn't wrong. I longed for days of exploration, not this endless march into darkness. But we couldn't afford to be idealists when the alternative was extinction. My response was measured, a tone perfected after sleepless nights. Adapt or die, Admiral. That's the cold reality we face. The Zinari won't change their tactics, so we must change ours. The Alliance held, however precariously. I sent out scouts, ships tasked not with expansion but with seeking out any hint of Zinari activity on the fringes of our territory. What we found turned my blood cold, they weren't just regrouping, they were evolving. The first Zinari scout we captured was. Different. Larger than the warrior drones we were used to, its carapace was thicker, and its claws had a jagged, serrated edge I hadn't seen before. The sight confirmed my worst fear, they were adapting to us. The thing thrashed in its containment field, hissing and spitting despite its missing limbs. 
Then came the truly terrifying part one of our Korean far seekers attempted a mind meld to glean any tactical information. Usually, the Zinari's hive mind was a discordant chorus of rage and hunger, but this time, there was something else. A cold, calculating sliver of awareness that recoiled from the Korean's touch. He staggered back, eyes wide with horror. There, there's a mind in there. Not just instinct, there's intelligence. They're learning. Panic fluttered through the command room like a startled flock of birds. I cut through the rising din with an order, sedate him, take it to the labs. Dissect it, scan it, find out what the hell we're dealing with. There was a grim satisfaction in seeing those modified claws, the nascent tactical mind, laid bare under the harsh surgical lights of our science vessel. Turns out, desperation was a hell of a motivator for our researchers. Within days, they unraveled a horrifying truth. The Zinari were integrating the DNA of conquered species into their own. The serrated claws, it turned out, were remnants of a reptilian race the Zinari had all but consumed on a system near our borders. This wasn't just about overwhelming force anymore, they were turning into an adaptable, ever-evolving nightmare fuel. This revelation was the slap in the face the Republic needed. The bickering died down, replaced by grim determination. My barbaric tactics weren't so radical anymore. We doubled down on efforts I'd begun after Tool Prime, pushing repurposing and unconventional weaponry to its limit. Old atmospheric cruisers meant for lazy sightseeing tours were retrofitted with electromagnetic pulse generators. Colony ships were re-armored, their cargo holds packed with proximity mines instead of families. Even the far seekers, so vehemently opposed to violence, were training with a quiet intensity that made even a hardened soldier like me uneasy. If there was anything resembling a silver lining to this mess, it was the unity forged in the face of true desperation. With this newfound resolve, I laid down a plan that made Blackbriar Protocol seem downright conservative. It hinged on luring the next Zinari wave into a trap, but not on a planet or in a star system. In an entire sector. Sector C-12 was on the very edge of Republic space, a sparsely populated region primarily known for its nebulae. Under the shimmering lights of those nebulae, we started our most audacious and terrifying project to date. We seeded it with cloaked mines, automated defense platforms cobbled together with scrap metal, and decoy signals designed to mimic the hum of a dozen thriving colonies. For bait, we left an actual skeleton workforce, barely enough to keep up the charade. It was a sacrifice, I knew that, but a calculated one. When the Zinari came, and we knew they would, drawn by the promise of fresh worlds to devour, they'd find a tempting smorgasbord and only a token defense. Then, we'd spring the trap. Our fleet would hyperspace in just long enough to cut off their retreat, and from then on, it wouldn't be a battle, it would be controlled extermination. The day came far faster than any of us were truly ready for. The familiar tingle down my spine told me the Zinari scouts were near. My gut clenched, but outwardly, I was a statue, projecting an authority I didn't entirely feel. C-12 was evacuated, the bait was carefully placed. We waited, a predator disguised as prey. The Zinari poured into the sector in a ravenous tide. Their new additions were obvious, lumbering bio-tanks grafted from some heavily armored species, skittering scouts with camouflage that warped in the nebula clouds. It was a brutal reminder that for all our efforts, the enemy was still a step ahead in the evolutionary arms race. My voice cut through the tense silence of the bridge. Trigger the decoy signals, maximum output. And tell our people in C-12, good hunting. The faintest flicker of relief washed over me. At least those brave souls wouldn't be dying in vain. They played their part beautifully. The Zinari descended on the seemingly oblivious settlements, their eagerness overriding any shred of caution the new intelligence might have instilled in them. Our decoy ships put up a pathetic fight, then scattered just as the real fun began. The mines we'd painstakingly cloaked rippled to life, not with planet-cracking force, but with calculated concussive blasts designed to cripple engines, not kill outright. Each explosion, followed by another and another, created a chain reaction of confusion and disarray in the heart of the Zinari swarm. Then came our fleet, barreling into existence with all the subtlety of a thrown brick. The Zinari capital ships, hulking masses of flesh and weaponry, were our first targets. Our cruisers unleashed volleys of torpedoes modified to release searing plasma upon impact, not enough to destroy the enormous ships outright, but enough to cripple them, seal them off in self-cauterizing wounds of molten metal. With their escape cut off, their battleships hobbled, we descended upon the Zinari like vengeful wraiths. Those retrofitted atmospheric cruisers swooped low, releasing bursts of electromagnetic pulses that scrambled the Zinari's internal calms and overloaded their bio-circuitry. The lumbering bio-tanks were torn apart by concentrated fire from teams of fighters, 
Their grafted armor proving insufficient against the sheer volume of firepower. We hammered them relentlessly, the swarm tactics I'd once meticulously studied turned against their creators. They were trapped, their single-minded focus their undoing. I could almost hear the cacophony of rage and confusion in my head, the hive mind recoiling at this orchestrated chaos. But what truly broke the Zinari wasn't the fleet, or the mines, or even the tactical brilliance displayed that day. It was the Corians. Their ships entered the fray last, broadcasting not energy beams, but waves of focused psychic disruption. It was agony made manifest, a thousand screams packed into a mental tidal wave. The remaining Zinari cohesion shattered entirely without their unified mind directing them. The battle devolved into a hunt. Ships that moments ago formed a terrifying armada dissolved into panic knots, fleeing in every direction they could. Our forces picked them off with brutal efficiency, no mercy, no quarter given. It was less a victory, more a methodical extermination. When the last Zinari ship winked out of existence, either destroyed or escaping with its wounded pride, a silence fell over my flagship. There were whoops of joy, tired sighs of relief, and more than a few tears shed. But there was an undercurrent of something else, a disquieting mix of satisfaction and cold horror. We'd won, yes, but in doing so, had we simply become a different kind of monster? Victory celebrations in the wake of Sector C-12 were short-lived and subdued. There was a lingering hollowness, the knowledge that any celebration could be cut short by the next Zinari wave. It grated against my nerves worse than any defeat ever could. We needed a different kind of victory, something decisive that would give us breathing room and not just the chance to catch our breath before the next onslaught. The key, as it often does, lay in information. We dissected every Zinari drone, run simulations based on their adaptive abilities, and poured over every scrap of intel gleaned from brutal interrogations of rare survivors. Their command structure was still an enigma. Without striking at the heart, the queen, if they even had such a thing, we were just swatting at an endless swarm. It was Commander Telix of the Tull Fleet who brought the breakthrough I was so desperate for. His fur was ragged, his eyes perpetually bloodshot, but his stubborn determination seemed to burn even brighter. They're not just adapting with each conquest, he rasped, unfolding a sensor map spattered with notes. Their newest ships, they're incorporating technology. Crude, but functional. It clicked in my mind, a single terrifying and potentially pivotal implication. The Zinari weren't just a biological plague, they were scavengers. If they'd encountered more than just primitive species in their galactic rampage, if they'd come across the wreckage of an advanced civilization. We might be looking at game-changing horror. A sweep of recently pacified Zinari ravaged zones confirmed our fears. Debris fields weren't just chaotic scenes of destruction, they had a pattern. Shields were scavenged, weapon systems crudely jury-rigged into bio-ships, even computer cores had been gnawed free and incorporated into their abominable living vessels. It was one thing to face a relentless swarm, another entirely to face one capable of turning our own technology against us. Fear gave way to icy resolve. We weren't just going to blunt the next attack, we were going to turn the hunters into the hunted. We needed to force the Zinari to come to us, on our terms, and cut off the source of their evolutionary leaps. The plan, when I dared voice it to the Republic Council, was met with a wave of stunned silence. Even Admiral Veer, so vocal in his opposition before, simply stared at me, the colorful feathers atop his head drooping slightly. Ambush. Inside their territory? He finally squawked, that's madness. It's a death sentence. It's our only hope, I replied, refusing to back down. They're learning from us, from every conquered civilization they scavenge. If we let them keep going, soon they'll be unstoppable. I saw echoes of my own desperation reflected in their eyes. They knew I was right. We assembled a fleet the likes of which the galaxy had never seen. Not an armada, but a law. Heavy cruisers, yes, but also seemingly vulnerable transports, salvaged freighters barely patched together, even a few hastily converted passenger liners. It was a fleet designed to make the Zinari salivate at the potential for easy slaughter and plunder. The bait, in the form of a strategically leaked transmission, was too tempting to resist, an isolated, heavily populated system ripe for the taking on the very fringes of the Republic. It was a lie, of course. I'd handpicked a dead system, light years from any actual inhabited world. Its only true treasure would be the hidden teeth of our trap. As the fleet traveled under cloaking fields, I sent out a constant stream of orders, my voice echoing across every Republic ship preparing for the most audacious gamble in history. 
the dead system was being seeded with sensor arrays capable of piercing even advanced cloaking fields, minefields masked not as shimmering energy but as natural asteroid clusters, and automated weapons platforms so thoroughly disguised as harmless space debris that even I had a hard time picking them out on scans. The hardest part wasn't just setting the trap, it was waiting for it to be sprung. With every parsec, my ship was leaving a trail the Zinari could follow. Every member of my crew was part of that lore, their lives on the line to entice the enemy. The tension became a constant ache in my chest, it made sleep impossible and turned meals into tasteless fuel. Then came the ripple in spacetime that signaled the enemy was near. It was a testament to the Zinari's arrogance, or perhaps desperation that dictated their own rapid expansion, that they didn't bother with scouts or subtle infiltration. The swarm descended on our decoy system with the roaring hunger of a beast too long starved. My voice cut through every ship, every comm unit, all ships, decloak and engage. Repeat, this is not a drill. Our seemingly easy prey transformed in the blink of an eye into a hornet's nest. The Zinari recoiled, their attack formations scattering in confusion as warships materialized from empty space. We hammered them, forcing them to fight their way through a barrage of mines and automated defense stations. Each moment brought us valuable time. Then, it happened. The seismic shift that had become a nightmare etched into my mind. The scattered Corian sensor probes detected it first, a massive surge in psionic energy emanating from the heart of the Zinari forces. The Farseekers recoiled in collective agony, their harmonious chorus of focus shattering under the sheer psychic pressure. The Queen, one of them choked out, she's here. The Zinari flagship was unlike anything we'd ever seen. It wasn't a mere bio ship, it was a grotesque amalgamation of half a dozen conquered species fused together with their own insectal biology. Weapon systems jutted out at improbable angles, shields flickered with ill-matched frequencies, and its sheer size defied all known limits of their growth. But there, pulsating amidst the horror, was a central chamber, and within it throbbed a mind vast enough to make even the most powerful Farseeker tremble. This wasn't just a command ship, it was the brain of the swarm made manifest. It projected not just hunger, not just rage, but a predatory intelligence that sent chills down my spine. This wasn't our first battle with the Zinari, but it was the first time I felt like the enemy was truly looking back at us. The combined firepower of the entire Republic fleet rained down upon the Queen ship. It shuddered under the onslaught, its patchwork shields overloading in dazzling bursts of light, but it held. Every shot we landed on it was one less aimed at elsewhere in our system, buying the sensor teams invaluable time. Their frantic voices crackled over the calms, a constant stream of positioning data, desperate and hopeful in equal measure. We have a lock. Targeting solution acquired, but it's a one-shot deal. The voice belonged to the tool chief engineer, his usual rumbling tones laced with tension. Every weapon that could fire was trained on the queen, waiting for my command. I glanced at the sensor readings, the cold calculations making my head throb. Just one shot, positioned perfectly to exploit a momentary vulnerability in the queen ship's defenses. To pierce that abomination and strike true to the heart. It was audacious, reckless. And it was our only hope. Fire. For what felt like an eternity, nothing happened. Then, the void itself seemed to scream as our combined firepower converged in a blinding beam. It pierced the flagship's defenses in a shower of organic debris and malfunctioning tech. The psychic aura surrounding it sputtered, then fled with terrifying intensity before winking out. Silence descended on the calms, broken only by the ragged breathing of the crews across hundreds of ships. Had we done it? Could it be that easy? Then came the answer, not in the form of joyous cheers, but in a horrifying new rhythm emanating from the battered behemoth. The queen ship was. Healing. Grotesque tumors of flesh blossomed outwards, sealing the wound we'd carved. Systems flickered back to life, and the psionic pressure resumed, though diminished. My first thought was rage, at myself, at the enemy, at the sheer unfairness of it all. Yet through that rage, a sliver of cold clarity cut through. I turned to the Corian admiral, feathers still ruffled from the psychic onslaught. Can you pinpoint it? The exact source of the psychic emanation? His eyes, bloodshot and haunted, gleamed with grim understanding. We can. A new targeting solution appeared on my display. It wasn't the vast ship that was our target, it was a single point within, deep inside that monstrous hole. I relayed the orders, my voice echoing with grim finality across the fleet. This was more than a high-risk run it was a sacrifice made before the battle had even properly begun. Three Corian cruisers, devoid of any weapons, streaked towards the Queen ship. They were a beacon against the chaotic backdrop of the battle, their intent clear even to the Zinari. 
The flagship's defenses were now fully online, lashing out swatting one cruiser aside like a mere insect. The second was crippled but managed to limp closer. Then, the last remaining cruiser did something that brought a gasp even to my own throat. They rammed the queen ship, not with intent to damage its hull, but to embed themselves within that pulsating flesh. A wave of terror unlike any I'd known flooded through me. The Koreans were our allies, a gentle people forced into violence I'd helped unleash. I stared at the flickering icon representing that cruiser, burrowing its way into the Nightmare Queen. Their psychic presence was a pinprick of defiant light in a pulsating epicenter of darkness. Then, the unimaginable happened. The Farseekers on every ship, every station, every outpost throughout the system, began to sing. It wasn't a song of war, but a mournful symphony of focus tinged with a desperate, terrifying joy. Their collective psychic might was a beacon, guiding that sliver of the Corian ship deeper into the belly of the beast. The queen, sensing the intrusion, focused her vast psychic might inward. It was a battle of minds fought on a level no weapon could touch, the raw, harmonious power of a thousand Corian souls against the focused malevolence of the Zinari hive mind. We watched helplessly. Our weapons thundered, hammering the flagship's defenses, shaking the very fabric of space itself. Yet, the outcome of this desperate gambit wouldn't be decided by missiles or plasma bursts, but within an obscene biomechanical maze crawling with abominations and echoing with the screams of two minds locked in a psychic war. The Queen's focus wavered. Distracted, she faltered. Our automated defense platforms, mere pinpricks compared to her ship, found their mark. Weapons punched through weakened shields, targeting key areas identified by the Corian sensor sweep. It was a death of a thousand cuts, not a single devastating blow. But it served its purpose, further weakening the flagship and buying the Corian strike team mere moments within the enemy fortress. A ragged cheer erupted on calms, followed by a sudden, stunned silence. The psychic pressure emanating from the Queen ceased. Had they done it? Could it be so simple? For a single, hope-filled moment, I dared to believe we had snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Then, in a psionic burst that sent far-seekers to their knees across the sector, the Queen screamed. And the Zinari swarm, shattered. The ships that a moment ago had been a coordinated nightmare descended into chaos. Some turned upon each other, some fled blindly into the void, others simply drifted, their engines flickering out as the guiding intelligence behind them was ripped away. The cheering started hesitantly, then built to a full-throated roar of disbelief and relief across the fleet. We had done it. We'd struck at the heart of the Zinari, and it wasn't a weapon that had won us the day, but raw courage and unimaginable sacrifice. The battle was far from over. Wounded and leaderless, the remaining Zinari were still a terrifying force. We hunted them through the system, picking them off with ruthless efficiency born from years of rage and pain. But now, there was a lightness to it, a sense that perhaps the tide might be turning, even if it was a tide measured in light years and painted in the blood of countless trillions. When the last Zinari ship was a tumbling cloud of debris, I finally allowed myself a moment's rest. Slumping into my command chair, every fiber of my being ached with utter exhaustion. Yet, there was a stubborn spark of something else in my chest, not pride at our victory, but a steely resolve born from witnessing the depths of both horror and selflessness. The Zinari wouldn't be so easily eradicated. Their queen, though dealt a devastating blow, was likely still alive, a festering wound from which new swarms might emerge. But we had taken the first step on a new path, one not just of defense and reaction, but of calculated aggression born from desperation. It scared me how much this new path felt. Right. My mind raced. We needed more than repurposed mining lasers and cobbled together asteroid launches. We needed true weapons, the kind that would make the Zinari tremble. We needed to take what we'd learned from them, from the countless dead civilizations they devoured, and turn it against them. As my fleet returned to Republic space, I began drafting not just recovery plans, but proposals that would have made me the villain of the story a few short years ago. Mobile shipyards to be secreted on the fringes of Zinari space, research programs delving into gene-tailored bioweapons to cripple their evolution, and strike teams trained to seek out and destroy nascent queens before they could mature. We had won a battle of survival, but the true war hadn't even begun. The news of our victory spread like wildfire throughout the Republic. I was lauded as a hero, a tactical genius who had broken the Zinari horde. But as I stood on a glittering podium, accepting medals and the cheers of an adoring crowd, I couldn't shake the image of that Corian cruiser disappearing into the monstrous wound of the Queen ship, or the echoes of their final, focus song ringing in my mind. I wondered how different I truly was from the monstrous Queen we had vanquished. Yes, I fought for survival, for a civilization I believed in, 
But with every audacious gamble, every sacrifice I authorized, the lines grew blurrier. A chilling question lingered in the back of my mind, one with no easy answer. To beat a monster, did we have to become something monstrous ourselves? Victory celebrations died quickly in the face of the new, daunting reality we faced. The Zinari swarm was, if not broken, heavily wounded. We'd bought ourselves time, how much, none of us could really say. But time wasn't a victory in itself, merely the space in which to achieve one. The Republic, hardened and bound together by the shared ordeal, embraced the transformation I proposed with a grim determination that still sent shivers down my spine. Research outposts on the fringes of Zinari territory turned into hidden weapons labs. Shipyards produced not just carriers designed for defense, but stealth-cloaked hunter-killers. We were no longer the underdog, we were the predator sharpening its claws. The Corians, always our moral compass. Their song was softer now. There was a darkness in their eyes, they had glimpsed the true nature of the enemy and had taken a harrowing step along the path I was determined to walk. Their farseekers trained alongside my strike teams, honing their psychic focus into weapons. Their once peaceful ships now bristled with makeshift energy projectors and modified sensor arrays designed to detect the faintest psionic whisper of a Zinari queen. Admiral Veer, his once vibrant feathers perpetually ruffled, had become my most vocal, and surprising, supporter. In less than a standard year, a laughably short time on the scale of most civilizations, we had become something unrecognizable. Our once ragtag fleet was now a honed blade against the darkness, a symphony of ruthless efficiency born from the ashes of desperation. It was a transformation that simultaneously terrified and filled me with a grim pride. The intelligence networks we had woven into the fringes of Zinari space began to bear fruit, but it wasn't the glorious news I longed for. Whispers spoke not of a shattered hive, but of division. The blow we had dealt their queen had caused a schism. Clusters of Zinari had broken off, carving out their own brutal territories, some even turning on each other. It should have been a moment of triumph, a chance to exploit their weakness, but it merely fanned the flames of my mounting paranoia. One evening, as I pored over the latest intel reports in the sterile solitude of my quarters, a familiar voice jolted me from the abyss of strategic considerations. You don't sleep much these days, Fleet Admiral. It was Telix, the tool commander, his fur a shade grayer, eyes burning with a relentless focus mirrored in my own. A luxury for peacetime, I replied, my tone clipped, a shield against the gnawing exhaustion. He merely grunted, the rumbling sound akin to distant thunder. I have a proposal, he began, tossing a data crystal onto my desk. I believe we may have found a queen. My heart gave a sickening lurch. A full-fledged queen, so soon after the last, it could mean a new swarm rising far faster than we'd anticipated. The data on display was promising, yet horrifyingly incomplete. An isolated Zinari brood, far enough from other clusters to offer a tantalizing target. But the sensor readings made my blood run cold. This wasn't a nascent queen, merely forming. It was. Different. The energy signatures were erratic, the psychic emanations chaotic. Mutated? Damaged from our previous strike? Either way, it represented an unacceptable risk. Too uncertain, I countered forcing my voice to remain steady. We strike now, we might eradicate them with minimal losses. But if this thing, this queen is somehow stronger than anything we've seen. I didn't need to finish voicing the nightmare scenario. Telix nodded grimly. Which is why we need to go deeper. He tapped a specific area of the tangled sensor web. We have detected an anomaly. A faint energy signature, heavily shielded. Technology, not Zinari in origin. A flicker of a long-forgotten emotion sparked within me, the thrill of discovery that had initially drawn me to the stars. The remnants of a conquered race? Perhaps, Telix rumbled, or something, more. A potential weapon against them. We must investigate. It wasn't a request, but a statement of shared, desperate intent. The plan we hammered out was a testament to how far we'd fallen. No grand fleet accompanied our strike team. Merely three cruisers, mine, Telix's, and a Corian vessel. Stealth, speed, and the element of surprise were our only allies in this gamble. We slipped into the brood's territory under thick cloaks, bypassing their scattered patrols. Ahead lay a desolate system, its planets stripped bare, moons reduced to debris fields. This wasn't a nascent Zinari nest, it was the picked clean carcass of a once thriving world. The source of the energy reading was coming from the largest remaining moon. Broken fragments of metallic structures clung to its cratered surface like barnacles. No sign of life, nothing but technological ghosts. We landed cautiously, 
Our strike teams a mix of hardened soldiers, tool sappers, and Corian far seekers. I led the way, more explorer than fleet admiral once more. Broken pylons jutted at twisted angles from the dust, remnants of power conduits snaked into gaping holes in the ground. We were walking through the ruins of something advanced, something the Zinari hadn't built, but had merely consumed. The deeper we ventured, the more the readings spiked. Whatever we were after, it was shielded, buried. The tall sappers deployed seismic charges, carefully placed to expose, not destroy. When they detonated, it wasn't with a roar, but with a groaning of tortured metal and the hiss of released pressure. Beneath the layers of rubble lay a sealed chamber. Its surface shimmered with unfamiliar alloys, etched with symbols that pulsed with a faint inner light. The air crackled with trapped energy, and the Corians hissed in a discordant chorus of unease. This wasn't just technology, Via whispered, a tremor in his usually steadfast voice. This was a prison. My survival instinct screamed at me to turn back, that we were treading on the edge of an abyss we couldn't fathom. But that same instinct, twisted and honed by endless war, demanded we see what lay within. The potential reward, however dangerous, was too great to ignore. With a synchronized movement, the sappers triggered the unlocking sequence. The seamless door segmented and slid into the floor with an ominous hum. The darkness within seemed to throb, a trapped echo of something vast and unnaturally still. And then the eyes opened. Two pinpricks of malevolent yellow light pierced the gloom. A roar that transcended sound, a wave of pure hatred, washed over us, throwing the far seekers back. The creature that lunged towards the light wasn't Zinari. It was a nightmare given form, segmented insectal body melded with the remnants of battle armor, energy whips crackling in place of claws, and a skull-like head crowned with crystalline shards. Its psychic scream was raw, chaotic, a stark contrast to the cold focus of the Zinari. I raised my weapon on instinct, but the creature that had clawed its way free of that ancient prison had no interest in us. It streaked past, launching itself towards the void with impossible speed. We scrambled out of the chamber in its wake, blast doors slamming shut behind us to quarantine whatever madness we had just unleashed. As our cruisers tore through the system, desperate to escape, I couldn't tear my gaze away from the frantic sensor readings. The creature was a blur, streaking directly towards the heart of the Zinari brood. It wasn't just escape it sought, it was vengeance. In the sterile command room of my flagship, the battle unfolded. The once coordinated movements of the Zinari were thrown into disarray by the sheer psychic maelstrom our accidental weapon became. Their queen, still recovering, shrieked in pain and confusion, not against the precision of the Corian mind strikes, but against the unfiltered chaos tearing at her fractured command structure. We struck then, merciless and efficient. Our ship started in, targeting the brood's nexus while that thing ripped through their ranks, its psychic screams a terrifying distraction. This was not a battle of equals, this was an extermination. When the last Zinari drone winked out of existence, we were left in a silence broken only by ragged breaths and the frantic beeping of instruments tracking the creature. It wasn't retreating. It was spiraling inwards towards the queen herself. My comm link crackled to life. Telix's voice echoed the horror in my own heart. It's going to finish her. And then what? Have we traded one monster for an even worse one? I had no answer. No comforting lie, no clever tactic. In our relentless pursuit of victory, we had unleashed something potentially far more dangerous than the scourge we thought we were destroying. Perhaps this was the price, the echoing consequence of the darkness we had embraced to survive. Perhaps in trying to beat a monster, we had not only become something monstrous ourselves, but had paved the way for something even worse to rise. We watched, frozen in a mix of revulsion and a perverse fascination, as the creature descended upon the battered Zinari Queen ship. Our long-range scans relayed the scene with horrifying clarity, tendrils of raw energy crackled around it as it tore through the fleshy hull with unnatural ease. The Queen's psionic scream was a panicked wail now, tinged with a terror we had only ever heard directed at us. For a breath-held moment, it seemed our gamble might pay its horrifying dividend. Then, with a psychic shockwave that made the Corians on board my ship recoil in agony, the energy signature around the creature shifted. It faltered mid-strike, its psychic roar choking into a broken whine. The queen wasn't just resisting, it was. Absorbing. We watched in dawning terror as the creature's energy whips sputtered. The segmented armor dimmed, the monstrous skull face flickered, and the yellow pinprick eyes blinked out. Then, with a final, soundless ripple, the light around it vanished completely, subsumed into the obscene bulk of the queen. She was grotesque now, not just a biological ship, but a being threaded through with circuitry, pulsating with a stolen energy that sent shivers down my spine. 
The fragmented psionic presence we'd become so familiar with wasn't diminished, it was, reforged. The fractured chorus was still there, but warped. Underneath the Zinari's innate rage and hunger was a new, chilling thread, a focused, intelligent malice that surpassed anything they'd displayed before. We made a mistake, I choked out, the full weight of what we'd done crushing me. A terrible, terrible mistake. The others, whole Korean, seasoned warriors all, could only nod in grim realization. It should have been obvious, the strange technology, the energy prison. That creature hadn't been a victim of the Zinari, it was a weapon some long extinct race had built against them. And we, in our blind arrogance, had handed it straight to our enemy. The revitalized queen turned her stolen eyes towards us. There was analysis there now, calculation. Her next attack wasn't a mindless surge, but a series of carefully targeted strikes. Our fleet, built with the old Zinari in mind, was woefully unprepared. The bio ships, still weakened, became tools, distractions to be sacrificed while the queen focused her newfound power. Korean cruisers fled and died under beams of coherent energy we'd never witnessed the Zinari use. Tall ships, their thick armor meant to withstand claws and acid, were speared by precise kinetic blasts that seemed to punch straight through. My flagship shuddered as a psychic pulse momentarily shut down our internal calms, plunging us into disjointed chaos. We scrambled, reconfigured, and desperately adapted with the speed born out of the countless near-death experiences. But it wasn't enough. This wasn't survival by the skin of our teeth, it was a slow, agonizing defeat. And then, an impossible glimmer of hope. A single Korean cruiser, damaged but still defiant, limped away from the main battle. It wasn't fleeing, but streaking towards the dead system where we'd unleashed our folly. The beacon it emitted wasn't a battle cry, but a song, of mourning, of sacrifice, of a species facing extinction with quiet, terrible dignity. The queen, so calculating, so focused on destroying our main fleet, faltered for a moment. Perhaps it was confusion, or perhaps a flicker of an old, instinctual fear of whatever had imprisoned that creature in the first place. That momentary pause was all the Koreans needed. Their cruiser rammed the cracked moon, burrowing into the ruins we disturbed. A moment later, a detonation that had nothing to do with explosives ripped through the very fabric of reality. Energy crackled outwards, a wave of searing power laced with a psychic dissonance that made even the far seekers on my distant ship scream. I braced for the backlash, expecting a wave of energy to tear my fleet apart. But it never came. Instead, something shifted. The queen's aura dimmed, then stuttered, not out of damage, but as if some fundamental building block of her essence was being pulled away. Her rage turned into a shriek of confusion and agony. The remnants of her fleet faltered, then scattered. It was the route we'd so often engineered against the old Zinari, but this time, even with our numbers thinned, victory held no sweetness. As the last Zinari ship flickered out of existence, I stood on the bridge of my battered flagship, surrounded by emptiness. Not just physical space, but the terrifying void of an uncertain future. Had we won? Yes, but in doing so we'd shown the galaxy a new kind of horror, far more cunning and adaptable than the swarm we'd faced for so long. We'd unleashed a devil in our desperation, and perhaps damned ourselves in the process. It was then a quiet voice broke through the despondent silence. Admiral Veer, a single bright feather drooping, stepped forward. They will return, he said, his voice thick with a grief that echoed my own. And we, we may not be ready. I had no comforting platitudes to offer, no brilliant strategic insights. All I could do was nod wearily in agreement and turn my gaze back to the starfield. I focused on one particular point, a now silent moon scarred by our actions, and made a silent vow. The Republic had evolved, warped into something far less idealistic than its founders had dreamed. But now we had a new fight, a new kind of monster to anticipate. In the darkest depths of space, new terrors were always lurking, and sometimes, those terrors were of our own making. The struggle was far from over, and perhaps now, it had only truly begun. In the aftermath, the Republic was less a unified star nation and more a patchwork of mourning and fear, stitched together with grim resolve. There was no time to celebrate or even truly rebuild. We analyzed the last frantic data from the Koreans before their noble sacrifice, studying the strange energy they'd wielded. And the even stranger effect it had on our monstrous creation. Whatever ancient weapon those unknown people had built inside that moon, it wasn't designed to outright destroy, but to unravel the very essence of the Zinari. They had become biological parasites, scavengers. And just like a virus, you couldn't truly eliminate it with brute force, but you might dismantle it, strip away its ability to replicate and spread. That became our grim new focus. The shipyards hummed not with the construction of mighty dreadnoughts, 
but small, fast strike craft. The research labs buzzed with a desperate energy tinged with dread, for they were reverse engineering our own folly, the energy siphon from the creature the Koreans had awakened. It was, uncomfortable, to say the least. To stand upon the precipice of discoveries knowing the source was their howling madness, now trapped within the very core of our enemy. I began suffering nightmares not of swarming insectal hordes, but of those burning yellow eyes and a roar that echoed not with hunger, but with the cosmic rage of something wronged on a scale I couldn't fathom. Yet, the alternative was unthinkable. We were a cornered animal, and as the weeks turned into months punctuated by tense reports of Zinari scout sightings, I understood that survival might mean truly monstrous measures. Then, one day, a sense attack with haunted eyes and hands trembling too badly to hold a data pad cornered me in a deserted hallway. Admiral. It's her, she choked out. The Queen. We found her. But. Her voice trailed off into a horrified whisper. The display she finally managed to bring up made my blood run cold despite the sterile graphics. The Queen, if you could call her that anymore, had found a new nest. It wasn't a civilized system picked clean like the countless before. It was a nebula, dense with gases and radiation, the kind of place starships avoided and life with it. Yet, she was thriving there. The tendrils of pure energy we'd seen her tap into had not just revitalized, but mutated her. Her form pulsed and shimmered on our long-range scans, bio-ship segments melding with swirling nebula storms like they were an extension of her monstrous self. She's adapting, Telix breathed next to me, the horror mirrored in his rugged features. Not just with stolen technology, but with the very stars themselves. She's not just a queen anymore, she's becoming something, new. The implication sent a wave of nausea through me. We'd faced a biological plague, an intelligent hive mind, perhaps even the vanguard of something worse. What we faced now. It defied all our previous understanding of the enemy. And then came the final blow. Amidst the swirling nebula clouds and the monstrous form of the queen, another signal pulsed. Faint, erratic, but unmistakably the same energy signature we detected from the unleashed creature. It wasn't just imprisoned inside her. It was replicating. We made a weapon, I whispered, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. And she's breeding an entire armory. Word reached other Republic outposts quickly. The tool prepared their world-cracking explosives, not to attack, but for a grim, self-sacrificial defense should the queen turn her gaze upon them. The Koreans fell into a strange, silent focus, their far-seekers meditated not to find tactical advantage, but to prepare their minds for the unimaginable horror they might soon have to face. My own flagship, refitted and rearmed with the experimental energy projectors, became a beacon in the empty vastness between Republic space and the Queen's new lair. Every sweep of our long-range scanners confirmed what we already knew, our time was running out. Whatever monstrosity was emerging from that nebula, it wouldn't be content to stay there forever. One night, haunted by nightmares of those burning yellow eyes, I finally acted. Calling a gathering of the highest-ranking officers, tall Corian, and a few humans whose eyes weren't entirely shadowed by exhaustion and despair, I laid out the bleak truth. We cannot wait for her to attack us on her terms. We've become the hunters, and a wounded beast is the most dangerous kind. Protests flared, words like final mission echoing off the cold metal walls of the command room. I silenced them with a raised hand. It's the only mission, the only chance we have. No more grand fleets, no glorious last stands. A handful of strike vessels, the very best tech we had hastily refitted to channel the unstable energy that was our only hope, and crews comprised of volunteers who understood the sheer madness of what they were about to undertake. The farewell was not filled with heroic speeches, but grim nods and quiet words of parting shared amongst comrades. My own heart was a lump of mingled determination and a despair so deep it threatened to swallow me whole. The battle ahead wouldn't be won, not truly. At best, we could buy time, bleed the enemy, and pray we weakened it enough that, perhaps, those who came after us stood a fighting chance. As my strike ship accelerated into the endless black towards the Queen's Nebula, her monstrous bulk shimmering on the tactical displays, I couldn't push away a single, terrifying thought, we'd spent so long fighting an unrelenting horror from beyond the stars, desperate to push back the encroaching darkness. And now, as those nebula storm clouds loomed, I wondered, had we truly become the best, or merely the worst, of what the galaxy had to offer?